This is a bathtub full of snakes. Hey there, little guy. If any of you sits in this tub of snakes, I'll give your mom $10,000. Oh, sorry, mom. Hello, and welcome to Mandatory Redistribution Party. I'm Sean Morley. And my name is Jack Lewis Evans. And today's episode is about people getting stuff. Do you deserve the stuff you've got, or should I give it to someone else? Mm, I don't know. I've got a lot of actually quite horrible stuff. It might not be fair to burden anyone else with it. Well, like, like what? Ghosts. You own a ghost? Yeah, I own a, yeah, I own a ghost. Um, if you want to help support the podcast, you too can get some of our own horrible extra content. So why not head over to patreon.com slash mandatory redistribution party to pledge a modest monthly dividend so I can build a nice life for myself in this haunted property. And we really do appreciate people sharing stuff on social media as well. Thank you. And with that said, it's time for us to... I'm dead. Oh, oh no. Who's this? What do you mean, who's this? I'm dead. And I know you don't like me. Don't like you? I hate you. I, I really hate you. Should I be here for this? This doesn't have anything to do with me. No, you can stay. Don't go. Don't go. Clear off. You shut up. Have you watched any YouTube videos by Mr. Beast? I have consumed some Mr. Beast content. I am not a subscriber. You don't have to be. You don't. But you don't have to be. Yeah, you'll get that recomm- size. You'll we get recommended. Yeah, we'll just end up. Yeah, yeah. What do you think of his? You know, strat his mo. I think I pr- he's very successful. So he's obviously good at what he's doing. His, his videos get like 20 million views, right? 20, 30 million views. That is... Uh-huh. And I know he's got like a staff smashing this stuff out. He's obviously very, very effective. He's also monetized philanthropy, <laughs> which I yeah. think is really interesting because a lot, so much of the stuff on YouTube uh, is like, I'm going to react to stuff. A lot of YouTube content, I'm not saying big content, but a lot of the content that gets made and put on YouTube is essentially people sat in front of their computer reading through articles they don't like or or saying why the new star wars is bad and is whereas this guy's built his brand in the most lib-brained way positivity and like oh i'm you know like a medieval king giving out money to the peasants like a popular king instead of the king that like hits people with a stick well, it's not even like a medieval king. It's like not a guy you would think would give out loads of money. It's more like you help a stranger in the woods, still in a medieval setting, and they turn <laughs> out to be the prince. And they're okay, like, oh, yeah, you saved me not knowing anything, but now I give you a giant sack of doubloons and a small vineyard. I don't think I've seen... I've seen stuff where he just randomly... him. Is it David Dobrik as well, who's the other similar type guy? They do big sponsorship deals and they'll do stuff like drive around giving people PS5s. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. film it. I think they probably do do the trick thing as well. And then all their. No, he doesn't do the trick. He just gives stuff out. I'm just saying it's like he's not someone that traditionally would be like coded as a powerful monarch. He is just a guy in a hoodie walking down the street. Well, he's a guy in a hoodie work- walking down the street, but he's also like millionaire multiple times mm-hmm. over, I think. So that is that is a king, isn't it? despite how he looks. That is a king. The last video he put out was called Extreme $500,000 Game of Tag. as 37 million views. Last to leave the circle wins $500,000, 49 million views. And quite humorously, I got hunted by the FBI, which has a thumbnail <laughs> of the FBI arresting him against a car. Do you know what I find interesting about his videos compared to other entertainment mm. where people get big prizes? Yeah. In that, like, game shows. I think that kind of positivity where you watch someone get a big thing, uh-huh. that, you know, he's not invented that. That no. has been, like, a kind of reality TV since the very beginnings of TV. Game but shows. Normally, 
Well, yeah, but normally you'd have to do a thing, right? You'd have to like got to win the game, run show. a gambit. Yeah, you've got well, to collect you got to stay in the circle. Last to leave the circle wins five hundred. You got to win tag. He's done a lot of that, and also he released an app which was actually an app like game mm. and you have to hold your thumb on the app and it goes live at a certain point and then everyone has to do it and whoever what? keeps their thumb on the longest gets like a huge cash payout what? but it can be competing against tens of thousands of people all of whom probably live in poverty and are making themselves ill with this thumb game in the hope of a big cash you have payout. to use your thumb does it know it's your thumb could you put like a sausage on it or something with a clip, I think not a, a peg, not a dead sausage. You could use a living sausage, probably microwave sausage. Oh yeah, it needs to be warm. Do you think it's what? Do you think it's got heat detection? Maybe it needs a fingerprint. I suppose sausages haven't got fingerprints. <laughs> well, it's nothing special to the app. It's it's what it's what's used to the text touch screen. That's why you can't like put a bit of a ham. Maybe you can. I don't know actually. <laughs> can you do touch screen with a piece of ham? Let please try and let us know. <laughs> yeah. Mail in now to earn your chance to win acknowledgement. <laughs> <laughs> But what I mean is, like... <laughs> we... Sorry, I've just seen a video title. Would you sit in snakes for $10,000? <laughs> well, okay, so this is... That's, like, <laughs> that's game show stuff, isn't yeah. it? That's still, like, you do a thing. But Did you do the, it? Here's some money. It's that the money is so much lower. Last to leave the circle, $500,000. Would you sit mm. in snakes? That's $10,000. That's the circle. That's much harder than the snakes. I think based on the sponsorship deals being of just varying amounts, you just have to, you can't yeah, always okay, pin yeah. the idea yeah, with yeah. the amount of money available yeah, yeah. always so big, neatly. Big Circle have got more money to donate than Big Snake. I mean, Big Snake's always <laughs> not been doing well for the big cash. When do you hear about Big Snake exactly, these days? Yeah, yeah. I just call it Snake. <laughs> <laughs> and unlike, you know, like a lottery, no one is like even signing up to be a part of it. Yeah. People are just living their lives. Uh -huh. And then, you know, magnanimity swoops upon them. Although it's not really magnanimity because he wouldn't, if there were no cameras, if for some yeah, reason yeah, yeah. his YouTube account got turned off, he wouldn't continue doing this, obviously, and no one thinks that he would. Well, as I said, it's, um, it's commodified philanthropy. Well, it's almost like it's kind of a pyramid scheme. In that mm -hmm. he gives the money out on the idea that he'll get more money in mm -hmm. and that he'll give more money out to therefore to make his old videos mm -hmm. seem less interesting, the new videos seem more interesting mm -hmm. on the basis that he can get an even larger sponsor. And it's based on this idea of like perpetual growth, which for yeah, years yeah. has been like, <laughs> it, it's been working. Now we can give out cars and houses, whereas previously he <laughs> would give out wads of cash. I mean, uh, so many YouTubers are like flashes in the pan. And also it's just this like churn of... Because if you think of other big YouTubers, if you think of like KSI, PewDiePie, and a lot of their stuff is mm -hmm. like gaming content or reaction content. So they're, they're kind of like doing similar stuff to like basic Twitch stuff, but uploading it as YouTube videos. PewDiePie's still got the most subscribers, 108 million subscribers. Mm -hmm. That's the early adopter. Uh, number two is something called, that I've never heard of, understandably, which is Kids Diana Show. <laughs> okay. Don't know what that is. I don't know if it's... Uh, like the young adventures of Princess Diana. Do you remember like the I hope so. series? That's what I... I'm Kids, no, I you're too young to remember. You're too young to remember <laughs> Princess Diana. Let's start right from the beginning. <laughs> Let's tell a story. Um, and Prince, young Princess Diana meets like important historical figures. <laughs> yeah. Princess uh, Diana speculative fiction made with CGI. <laughs> Princess Diana young adult series. <laughs> <laughs> Princess Diana the second coming. <laughs> Number three, Little Nastia. That's a child vlogger. Vlad and Nikki, child vloggers. Dude Perfect. I know that, I think. I think they do, uh, they like do stunts they do or tricks. they they're, they're, they're uh. going to be some of the slow-mo guys. Something's yeah, going to yeah, happen yeah. and then it'll be done in slow-mo in 4K. And then at number six is Mr. Beast. Right. But Mr. Beast is very different from all that, that other stuff we've just described. He's certainly not. I think he's, he's closest different. to Dude Perfect. Yeah, because he's not. PewDiePie is like much more gaming content. The other stuff is kids. He's probably quite close to the tricks that because it's ultra high production values. That's why he has a team of like fifty people. I think it's not a personality channel. You want to see this guy get a car, and Mr. Beast just facilitates that. And so the guy gets a car, and you want to see what happens and what it looks like mm. when a guy gets a car randomly. Mm. I don't see that in life, just like I don't see in Dude Perfect. I can't see a guy throw a frisbee out of a skyscraper onto a frog yeah, I guess in that's... 4K, but slow down to a tenth of a speed. You're not clicking on it because it's Mr. Beast. You're clicking on it because of the clarity of the concept of each video. The concept of each video is very clear. Yeah. I'm going to give this guy a barrel of cash. Yeah. 
And then I, I click it and go, hmm, do you think he'll like, oh, will he like the barrel of cash? Oh, he does. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess people, people watch that because of the, A, the stupid concepts like, you know, it's a good question. Would you sit in snakes for $10,000? Probably want to mm. you might want to know the answer to that. And then also people think, I would like money. Money would help my life be less bad if Mr. Beast gave me money. So then you can live vicariously through the people sitting on snakes. Yeah, it's kind of like economic escapism. Mm. And you just see a person get stuff, which is not the case in like a quiz show or a game show. Mm. I think actually when you're watching a quiz show or a game show, the bit where they get the prize is actually the least good bit of the show. Mm. Mm. You want to see them do a thing. You want to see if they can recite the name of this king or queen or grab on the floating bits of paper and a big crystal. But also, I you don't might, care about how much money they have. Maybe you want them to fuck it up and shout the answers at the screen or something and maybe you get that from these premises as well. Of like, I'd sit on the snakes for way longer than that, you stupid fucker. Yeah. Yeah. I've been sat on them for weeks by now. I'm sat on snakes now. Up. Where's my money? Yeah. I'm sat on snakes for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> I've not been given an incentive to do this. So look at me. <laughs> I've been bit. <laughs> I'm in a snake. Yeah, I'm ill. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being digested. <laughs> and this is what gets me, right? So one of his, like things is he doesn't live in like a gated community or a mansion uh, he just lives in a house right in suburbia of south carolina i think oh, who knows america and so he's gonna drive out and do these things but presumably there's like a limit to how far he's gonna drive mm. right why drive 200 miles to give someone a million pounds when you could drive 10 miles to give someone like it's not it's not gonna be a better person <laughs> why increase away. your loss <laughs> yeah, by right. the cost Why of a tank of fuel? petrol. Yeah. The <laughs> you already spent a better. million pounds. You don't want to push it too far, you know. And so there's going to be this catchment, mm. which I'm going to call the Mr. Beast catchment. <laughs> like where a your school. odds. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I think it should be like a school because when you live inside that catchment, yeah. like let's say I'm a, I'm a realtor and I'm trying to sell you the house. I say, oh, this is in the this Mr. Beast catchment. Do you watch YouTube? And they go, oh, I don't know what that <laughs> is. He goes, okay, well, there's a guy. Prices. Well, there's a guy who lives nearby and sometimes he gives out millions of dollars or or houses or cars. And you're actually in the catchment that he'll drive to to do that. So if you live here, I'm not saying it will happen. It's not likely. But the reason this house costs so much is because it's in the Mr. Beast catchment. A new previously unconceived form of gentrification, YouTuber house price inflation. Well, wow. I think specifically if a YouTuber gives out loads of money. But then yeah. again, you could be a YouTuber that just films on the street a lot. Because mm-hmm. you could be in that. You know, you could be in one of those YouTuber videos. Mm-hmm. That's why it costs an extra 10k a month. <laughs> it could, it, you could catch a glimpse of yourself with motion blur, horribly yeah. taking a bite out of a Zinger burger. Yeah, you could see yeah, you could see yourself as one of those weird-looking individuals that, as a joke, the editor that the YouTube sends it off to just zo- crash <laughs> zooms in on and does like an Eric Andre cut. <laughs> Yeah. It's the next thing. You could be mocked in yeah. that way. Tim Allen pops up and goes, <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, I was actually feeling pretty, I was feeling a bit yeah. bad. I've just been through a breakup. Yeah. That was a comfort burger because yeah, actually yeah. things have been going pretty yeah, bad. I broke my but, six um, years of vegetarianism yeah. after a drug. I have to say that. And... But I have to say that smash zoom's actually really, yeah, yeah, <laughs> really, really cheered me up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think it's really interesting that he just lives out. And I think the um, cultural and social capital of YouTube is being authentic. Mm. And because um, showing off your house and showing where you live mm. is such a big thing. And you can, I, you can fall straight down the middle of what I think is a cultural line of modern content creators. Mm. Rather they go, okay, well, here it is. I live in a mansion, okay? <laughs> I got famous on TikTok yeah, when yeah, I was yeah, 17. Yeah, yeah. And now I live in a mansion. And I can't stop making videos because my parents have become dependent on me. <laughs> or you go the other way and you go, I started YouTubing when I was 23. I'm incredibly jaded, but I still live in this small apartment. So you know I'm actually just like you. Mm. I'm living in a place that is less than 0.01% of my net worth. Wow. And so you've got these people who, um, especially if they give out money, they're like just incredibly powerful people who just live down the road. And I think the like what that must do or what that must feel like, this ludicrously powerful person. There's this thing that in medieval history, mm. there's there's a point when people think of like what a town looks like in medieval Europe, yeah. they're gonna think of like a big Mott and Bailey castle and they're gonna mm. think, Oh, the king lives in the keep in this big tower that like surrounded by either mm. 
the the family of nobility or advisors and stuff. Yeah. And that like came about like halfway through the medieval period, but before right. that, towns were like made of wood, right? Oh, they, yeah. They'd like classic. And so there'd be like a big wooden fence, and in it, there's just wooden little huts. Yeah. And so the king just lives in another hut. There's a special kind of political power that only really exists in this mm. time, mm. which you get from like being the king's neighbor, or <laughs> the king comes into your shop on Sundays to like get a kipper. And you could be, hey, king, oh, yeah, yeah, how are you going to do a war? I, I've got some thoughts on that. Like, I said, oh, okay, yeah, yeah I love you, kippers. you talk to your neighbours, even if your neighbour was the king, you're not, you just don't want to, it would be nice you're if you are talking as a 21st century jaded fool. Back then, everyone was friends. <laughs> With the king? What, you like knocking on the king? Have you got some sugar? Wouldn't you? No. He's a fucking king. He could kill me. He could exile me. Or you could be, get the best protection of anyone in the town because the king is your friend. Well, no, because imagine... Then you become unkillable. Yeah, you become they, unkillable. What? Let's say someone wants to start a pub brawl with you and you're the king's mate. What if they hate the king? And they're like, oh, there, there's, there's Jack, he's fucking mates with the king. Let's fucking smash a bottle yeah, on his head. come at me. I'll tell the king what happens. Oh, tell him every- when you're fucking dead because you've been glassed by Gloric the Big. I would be out drinking with the king, thank you. I think you're very optimistic about how sound the king would be. I think the king would be, you know, like if, you, if, if you've had a rough day and you're like doing, I don't know, whatever some fucking medieval idiot's going to do in the middle of the night, you might be like, oh, I'm just going to play bongos, going to smash my bongos for a bit. And then the king's like, can you shut the fuck up? I'm trying to sleep and you're on the bongos. Like, I thought I was yeah. playing quiet. I'm really sorry. I'm going to banish you. Soured. Yeah, you've been banished now. Yeah. Like, oh, I've been banished for bongoing. <laughs> The first ever bongo banishment of the 11th century. I think, I think comes, so what I'm saying is, I think there comes a point where you get too close to the king slash Mr. Beast. So I think Mr. Beast isn't going to give money to his immediate next door neighbours. I think you have to be a certain distance away from Mr. Yeah. I know it's Mr. Beast. Think how eggy the vibe would be if your neighbour gave you 10 grand for sitting with some snakes. <laughs> yeah, for a YouTube video. <laughs> yeah, like, that's weird. That dynamic is fucking weird. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I, wouldn't yeah. Want, I wouldn't want that. And I don't, think, I don't think either party would want that. Like, if I was Mr. Beast or the king... I don't I know, I like... would want loads of money. If uh, someone yes, came you'd want loads of my money. Neighbor, it would be weird, though, because I would be beholden to them, right? Yes, you don't want to be beholden. But... This is why people don't talk to their neighbours. They don't want to be beholden. Come on. You would be beholden to your neighbour if your neighbour was going to give you a million pounds. I can't be bought. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I have been put in more awkward, long-lasting, impactful social situations <laughs> for, for a cake. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> For access to trifle. Uh, so actually, if everyone's ordering pizza, I'm going to stay here. Even yeah. though I don't like all these people. Well, here's what I mean, right? Even though you right. are able to talk through why it's not a good idea, uh-huh. you do know that like powerful people get toadies and people love toadying up to power. And it will be ah. inevitable if powerful people... But Mr. Beast's toadies fucked him off, didn't they? Because he was like allegedly bullying them. Allegedly. Some of them did. Actually, those allegations came from people he hired in who weren't his friends. So most of the people he hired in initially were all his mates. He's like, oh, I'm like a millionaire now. Get all my mates in. Then he got extra staffers in and he bullied those ones. They're the Ah, people that did the expose on him. ah, Yeah, non-friends. Employees. So they weren't toadies. They were employees. (laughs) Yeah. The toadies get the benefits. But I just mean that's the reason the king probably escaped into the keep. Because everyone's like, hey, King, do you want an olive? It's like, just yeah, fucking hell. just let me adjudicate Build over the bushels. me a tower, and I don't want to talk yeah. to any. I only want to interact with other monarchs. Get me yeah. some ambassadors, which are other King's toadies. I'll talk to them. That's all yeah. I want to do. Ambassadors are like radios for Kings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only yeah. other Kings get it. <laughs> yeah. I, I need to talk to someone about what it's like to be a King. <laughs> Uh, People, this tavern I, master I doesn't get it. Yeah, I can't complain. I can't complain to the blacksmith. He just doesn't yeah. understand my struggle. He keeps talking about how oxidization's warping the metal, and I'm like, but I don't get you. This is the cultural <laughs> divide at its worst. He keeps talking about how his first son can't lift the hammer well. <laughs> yeah, he keeps talking about how one of his arms like three times the size of the other. 
<laughs> if he walks too long, he goes in a circle. I tried, to, I tried to explain how the crown he'd made me was actually a little bit too heavy, and if could you redesign it? Yeah, and he shattered it in front of me with a giant ebony axe. And then I didn't want to, but I had to kill him and his family. <laughs> yeah, I've actually banished his entire bloodline to the yeah, sea, and I didn't want to do that. That was his fault, and no one else is going to. Who else gets yeah, that? The blacksmith knows how to push my button. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what I mean, right? If if you get like really powerful people that are just like accessible, mm. people will like toady to them. And that's why like I think a lot of these famous like mansion YouTubers mm. You watch their videos, and there's just like people around who are never introduced. Yeah. There's just like this constant weird entourage of like other blonde, incredibly fit friends. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, do we get to find out who these people are? No. Now we're going on this Jeep to do laps around my mansion estate. Yeah. Cool, man. Every now and then they'll wake up one of those people by slapping them in the face with a bit of ham or something. Like you have to, you've got to the point where you have to like make context. It's made you a millionaire and you live in a mansion, but that's reverted you back into like secondary school culture where everyone's horrible to each other for no reason. But now it's, Clicks. now it's monetized. Yeah, now yeah. it's monetized. But this is what I think a lot about, like how power has retreated. And now power is increasingly falling into like media figures who want to be seen as relatable. Mm. So then they become like slightly more accessible. Like Elon Musk, mm. he is now, while he still lives in like that little Texas star base, he's like famously downsized into this little house. And also you can like tweet him. And you can tweet him, right? And I think there's really interesting good and bad sides to that mm. phenomenon. The one thing I want to talk about is how. If power is entirely hidden away in the keep, mm, mm, mm. it just means that, like, there's always the powerful people still mm, will have friends yeah. and advisors yeah. and relatives. Yeah. And it just means only their concerns really get listened to. Like, if, if there's like two rare diseases crop up in the world and one of them's just f is in the body of some poor single mother on an estate, but one of them <laughs> arrives in the body of Michael Gove's niece. We know which one of those is going to be raised in Parliament first because mm. one person's got the ear and one person hasn't. And what we're getting now is like power increasingly doesn't exist within like formal politics. This is these, these massive media figures like Elon Musk claiming openly and without accountability that he will coup wherever he likes for resources. That is the that's a power on par yeah. with a government. <laughs> I will destroy another country on purpose for resources. I mean, usually one may suggest you have that to have a state is, for that. Capital is more powerful than states in many ways. Uh -huh. And the state could be, dare I suggest, a simple tool of capital. I'm just suggesting. Well, who knows? <laughs> who, who knows? <laughs> who who among us? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm rolling a magic eight ball right now. <laughs> What's it saying? It's broken. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it says. Yeah. <laughs> now it just says help. <laughs> but I just think there's, firstly, it's interesting that there's these powerful people who like you can get to and get mm. at and mm. like walk up to and go, I know you. And they sort of have to live with that and learn how to navigate that world. They also have um, fucking bodyguards. I guess I'm just, just going off what's in the video, but you're right. The bodyguards are going to be behind the camera. They're not going to be visible. If, if Mr. Beast has got 50 staff, I think at least two of them are snipers. Yeah, if you scroll through Mr. Beast videos, I, I don't know, but I guarantee that every now and then you've, you'll see a little red dot. He'll come up to give them money and he goes... You gave him loads of money. What the fuck are you doing that for? And then you just dot. see this yeah. red dot. And he goes, but I would like it. And yeah. then the red dot just goes away. <laughs> well, they wouldn't know the red dot was on them. They'd, their friend would have to go tap them. Sniper. Nudging your mate's point at a drone. Yeah. Shimmering in the sky. Yeah. With a massive like ARG. <laughs> um, and the other thing that really interested me at Mr. Beast videos mm. is... I think, that, for one, think that he's not a beast. I think that that's interesting. No, I think all people are beasts, and it's glad that he's acknowledged it. I think it's not, I think it's not good to conceive of human beings but as outside of sense the animal if kingdom. Everyone's a beast. Well, yes, I agree with that. We're all creatures. But I think, beast, well, I think we act like we're not sometimes. Well, yes, but beast, Mr. Beast suggests, you're <laughs> suggesting that everyone's a, you know, a beast, a creature. Mr. Beast is yeah. suggesting that he is a beast and perhaps other people aren't. I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe that's my reading of it. Maybe he means, maybe he's trying to get across. We're all creatures. I'm the only beast. <laughs> <laughs> he just doesn't seem I very beast-like. You know what I mean? Well, I think that's what's so compelling about it. Because you say no matter how you act, 
no matter how you dress it up, we're all beasts. But beast makes me think of the, you know, the sort of very clever X-Men character, the blue beast-like figure. Exactly, playing on the same idea, right? No matter how you uh, dress it up, this guy is as erudite as they come. It's not as erudite as Beast from X-Men. No, I'm saying Beast from X-Men is as erudite oh, right, as they come. right, okay, I think that Mr. Beast. Yeah. Mr. Beast from X-Men feels like he should be called Mr. Beast. He's not called Mr. Beast, he's just called Beast. Well, yeah, Dr. No, Hank yeah. McCoy. Well... <laughs> But I think Hank McCoy is Mr. I suppose he's just Mr. McCoy. But I think he's Mr. Beast. And maybe maybe this YouTuber should be called... Beast is actually Dr. Beast. Yes, actually. We've got a PhD. That's true. So that's the yeah. distinction. Mr. Beast, the YouTuber, does not have a doctorate. Yeah, he's really pushing that he's a layman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's his gimmick. <laughs> layman Beast. <laughs> there is no education category on Mr. Beast's wikipedia page which leads me to assume he has never been educated so perhaps he was raised in the wild therefore Feral. explaining so he's raised in the wild someone gave him a phone and he's just figured out the youtube algorithm and that's his beasthood that's the premise of his name this first video if you scroll back is watch me learn the intricacies of human society <laughs> <laughs> watch me teach myself language <laughs> how did he type the title I suppose he would have typed it after learning because the video he did. Yeah, he wouldn't yeah, do it first, yeah. yeah, yeah he yeah, also yeah. got to record the footage before yeah, upload it, so. Yeah, he's yeah. smashed it. <laughs> he's got it. <laughs> Hello, friends. Seeing as this episode is about getting money randomly, I want to talk briefly about getting money justly. I would like to tell you about something called the Wilt Chamberlain Argument. Wilt Chamberlain was an amazing basketball player in the 1960s. But Wilt Chamberlain didn't make the Wilt Chamberlain argument. A philosopher called Robert Nozick did. Also, it's not really an argument about basketball. The Wilt Chamberlain argument is an argument in defence of inequality. It's the argument you'll hear in defence of billionaires. It's the argument that the rich are rich because they work harder or are more talented or are just more valuable than you. Sorry to any rich listeners there who I have erroneously included in you. Please consider supporting us on Patreon. You very rarely encounter the Wilt Chamberlain argument in its original form, but I think it's worth checking out. I think it's worth checking out, so let's have a little look. So, here we go. Imagine a society in which wealth is distributed in a way that you think is fair. Your ideal system. This is Distribution 1. Distribution 1. Robert Nozick says you have to be fine with this distribution because Robert Nozick let you pick it. Imagine that in your society where wealth is distributed in the way you think is fair, there exists the talented basketball player, Wilt Chamberlain. Nozick invites you to imagine that Wilt Chamberlain has in his contract with the basketball team that everyone coming to watch has to pay an extra 25p into a box at the gate. Every one of these 25p's goes straight to Wilt Chamberlain after the game. Robert Nozick now wants you to imagine that over a season, a million fans voluntarily pay their extra 25p into the box. Wilt Chamberlain now has £250,000. This is Distribution 2. Distribution 2. Remember Distribution 1 was however you wanted it? You dirty commie. Now you've got, through entirely voluntary interactions, Distribution 2. Wilt Chamberlain has got a quarter mil from his special box. Nozick now asks you, pops out of a, a bin and he says is this new unequal distribution just he let you pick the first distribution and you thought that was just so surely given everyone started in that just position and everything that's happened in between is voluntary when they put their 25 p's in that was voluntary this new unequal distribution is also just wilt chamberlain is entitled that's nozick's words entitled to his 250,000 pounds furthermore nozick reckons any attempt by the state or anyone else to redistribute wealth from Will Chamberlain would now be unjust. Unjust. So we have justified inequality. And this is Nozick's beef with socialism, or at least the socialism in his Cold War American brain. In Nozick's own words, the socialist society would have to forbid capitalist acts between consenting adults. So that's the Will Chamberlain argument. I imagine, even while listening to it, you'll notice some interesting things that you might have seen elsewhere, because uh, so many other arguments are kind of rooted in this. I'm sure you spot a few. 
Uh, let, let's see if we've got the same one. So firstly, they always pick a sports person, don't they? They always pick a sports person when defending the rich. It's funny how they never pick like a petrochemical oligarch that owns the basketball club or the football club and they take the vast majority of money without ever touching a ball. Like one of the maddest things about this thought experiment for me is that Nozick thinks that a capitalist who owns this club would let Wilt Chamberlain add his special 25p box that they wouldn't take a cut out of. Secondly, that little first distribution trick, that's cheeky. Distribution one, remember that? Remember Nozick let you do that? Wow. Nozick seems so generous when he lets you choose how to, quote, distribute the wealth. Buddy. Buddy. Redistribution. Who are you arguing with? Fucking Lib Dem. I want workers' democratic control of the means of production. I don't want to just move numbers around bank accounts. If Will Chamberlain did then somehow end up with £250,000 under a genuinely leftist system, what could he actually do with it in an economy based on need rather than profit? Like, he can't be a landlord. So, like, extract rent, they're gone. He can't start a business by like, telling workers what to do. It doesn't have to be worker controlled. He can't be extracting surplus value from anyone. So, he's got his £250,000. What's he actually going to do with it? Uh, somehow, I don't think Nozick thought about any of these questions. I think the limit of his imagination was move numbers round bank. But the glaring, bizarre thing here is Nozick's total ignorance of the horrific violence that brings capitalism about. Like, no one's starting from the s same egalitarian or equal distribution. That's why I think he has to let you make up distribution one, because he knows he's fucked otherwise. You have to imagine a fair thing that then becomes an equal. Like, private property and wage labour aren't natural or inevitable. They were established by violence and are maintained by violence. Like, workers don't enter the labour market voluntarily, nor do they volunteer for an economy where spending money from labour was their only way to get stuff. Like, oh, they voluntarily put their 25p in the box. Where the fuck did that come from? The capitalist system was brought about by centuries of class war. Like, I mean, Wilt Chamberlain. He's picked Wilt Chamberlain, who is a black American. Just think about the horrors that must have been endured by this guy's ancestors alone that knows it's just ignoring. Like, never mind the special box at the stadium. Robert Nozick probably owed Wilt Chamberlain at £250,000 in reparations. There you go. That's the Wilt Chamberlain argument. And a couple of reasons I personally think it's fucked. What more can you think of? Get in touch. <laughs>
and I saw some others, saw a whole bunch of fuck stuff working that job. Um, I saw more people than you might guess just piss themselves directly in front of me in the queue. Okay. Pretty fucked. And I really vividly remember one of the guys who pissed himself used to come in every day and buy a pack every day of 20 Benson and Hedges. Mm -hmm. And he'd go, 20 Bensons. And he would pay for it in like the exact coins. And he would held the coins in the queue for the whole queue. And then he'll empty them into it. He wouldn't empty them onto the till. He would only empty them into your hand. He must have had an issue where they rolled off. Yeah, he must have had a yeah, bad nightmare. And then someone must have made him pick them up or something. Or he's conscious of the queue. And it was just... It was a bad vibe. Well, I think it's mad that coins are round. We've yeah, all got a stupid. nightmare story of, yeah, yeah. I've got to give you a round 10. Coins should be square. 10 coins. And then one coin just goes off on yeah, an adventure. Fucking stupid. Why are they round? That's, Why are they that's round? fucking stupid. Makes them harder it's to like store. You want that to happen. Yeah. Notes aren't round because yeah. people fucking know. Coins should be square or, or rectangular. Anyway, this woman would come in and buy scratch cards every day, which was dark in and of itself, but she won... And she won a hundred quid, which mm -hmm. I think was a sufficient amount to just get out of the till, and then you just write it up or whatever. What did she do with the hundred quid? Uh, loads of Bensons. <laughs> she, she didn't smoke. She, they're, they're two different addictions. Starting. She's going to start. Yeah, she's going to start. <laughs> Finally, I can afford Benson hedges. But she spent the whole hundred pounds on scratch cards. Oh no! And then she she no. scratched she scratched the scratch cards just to the side of the till, every single one of them, and didn't win a penny. <laughs> she scratched a hundred scratch. I They're watched like a pound at that point, right? I watched it. Some of them That's are different ones. So are different ones. That like really sticks with me. I was just I'm, I'm still back on losing money yeah. and how all of our physical money seems designed to be easily lost. Right, we've got metal stuff that can't be taken by the wind but will roll away, and yeah. the rest of it's just paper. I live in a quite a windy yeah. city. <laughs> what, have you had wind take your paper money? What are you doing? No, I've dropped Hold paper on money. Oh, okay. No, yeah, yeah. I've, you know, everyone can drop anything, okay. right? Yeah, that's, yeah, excellent. That's one of my theories. <laughs> that's, a, that's true. Nothing's undroppable. That's provable, yeah. But you need to be able to get it before right. the wind takes it, and if yes. the wind takes it, the, that's gone. Have you never ran it after money? No. I have run after money several times I would. in my life. I would. I, if, if that happens to me, I would. I'll run, after, run after a note. It. Yeah, I'll, yeah, of course, yeah. I'd and how after. long I will run for before giving up will scale with the denomination. I'd get scared. Do you know what? I'd get scared because if I was chasing it, if it was a £20 note flying away, I'd like worry that I was chasing it into traffic. I worry about it now, but I think if I was chasing the £20 note, I wouldn't be paying attention. I'd just be paying attention to the £20 note and I would, I'd get run over or something. I'd pay attention to traffic for a £5 note. But if it's 20, I would die. I, I would get Final Destination <laughs> by paper money. It's good to know what's going to Final Destination here, mm. given that it's inevitable. <laughs> but given there's all this money that it seems to be designed to get lost, I think it's only <laughs> fair that our economy um, grants us lots of opportunity yeah. to randomly acquire money yeah. we haven't yeah. earned. Uh -huh. And that's why I think, like... <laughs> That's why I think on some level, little lotteries and little ways that you can get money is good. Uh, it's not fair that they're like probability weighted against the consumer. <laughs> but if they weren't, no. I don't know if I've got an issue. <laughs> what, not-for-profit raffles and scratch cards? Yeah. Uh, Nationalised, state-sponsored things where you can just... And you don't have to pay. It's just like a lever, and there's a 1 in 10,000 chance you get £100. But you can only do it once a day. Because you uh, can't get addicted. You can only do it once a day. And you don't lose any money. I think you're sort of inventing bonds. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm the second person ever to invent bonds. <laughs> How much money have you found, do you reckon, total in your lifetime? You know, like found, discovered money, both in terms of bits of coins in your own sofa, which is probably just yours anyway, or, uh, you know, like in the wild. Ooh, it's 20p there. I hate finding money because oh. it throws you into such a moral quandary depends how, much. depends how much and it depends where it is if it's right in the middle of the ocean could be like treasure yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> well you probably can have it right yeah but then the guy who found the sax um what was it the saxon hoard uh -huh. he could have just like have it right you can't just have treasure. Yeah, but I'm talking about like... <laughs> You're talking about money. I'm talking yeah. about like, oh, I sort of fucking just found 50p on my walk. I'll, I'll take 50p. What's your cut sometimes you What's might your, find... So everyone's got like an upper and lower cut-off. Upper is where you think, I've got to put effort into finding who's dropped this. Yeah. Lower is it's not worth picking up. 
the place that you will find it is going to be a populated place. So let's mm. say you are you're walking along a street, mm. like a high street, right. and you see twenty pounds on the floor. Where? It's, what, what it's town? relatively what near. Town? Um, we are in Kings Heath. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and it's you can see an ATM. Right, and you think, okay, twenty pounds here. Mm-hmm. You could give it into the the, bank. the building that the ATM the is attached to. Oh, ATMs aren't always on the bank. Up, yeah, it's a yeah, shop. I mean, you could go. I mean, this, you could go. Oh, did anyone just drop this? But you'll get three people saying yes. You know, they got no fucking way as well. If you just give it to the shop, they got no fucking way to get that back in the ATM. That's a horror show. They'll just tell yeah. you to keep it. I would if well, I was on the till. <laughs> I think if it's a large amount, you can put it behind and say, "Hold this for twenty four hours. See if someone comes for it." Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If it's a large yeah. nomination and people know they've yeah, yeah, they've dropped yeah, yeah. it, yeah. then um, there's someone coming saying, "Has have you got this specific denomination of money back here it's that I dropped?" It's a night. I think I'd still say it's it because it's, it's just a nightmare to prove. Yeah, it's a nightmare to prove. If someone it's gets wind that there's fifty pound behind the counter that's up for grabs, if you go in and say, oh, yeah. "I forgot this yesterday," so you'd have to kind of do it. So you'd have to if you hand it in, you'd have to do it like when there's no one else in the queue. Mm-hmm. Like, listen, mate. You'd I have to tap it out this. in Morse code or something. I don't want the yeah, t- 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 I don't want the guilt of of holding on to this because I don't want to steal. Someone might need this for like the medicine or something. Yeah. If they come back, here it is. If you're in a crowded area but you need to hand the money in, you can exp- you can write out a little explanation, yeah. put it in with the money, and then shake it into their hand like it's a bribe, and yes. just pretend you're bribing them. Yeah. Say, I hope we can come to some kind of understanding. Yeah, yeah. Or actually bribe them. Or just actually bribe them yeah, with yeah. that money yeah. to become the manager of the shop. <laughs> That's and then you could put a security camera by the ATM. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I've yeah. not helped that person, but I won't let it happen again. The security camera by the ATM. The person comes back, they're looking for the ATM, and then yeah. you talk through the tannoy. I can see you, and your money's gone. <laughs> yeah. However, I have named the camera after you. <laughs> <laughs> Since you're the donor. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this is what it is. Like People lose money all the time, so there should mm. be ways to just randomly get money to offset that right. and ensure some kind of equilibrium. So you think everyone should automatically be entered into the lottery all the time? Well, just to check, right? The lottery the, yeah. is not for profit, is it? What, where's the money for that? They seem to fund a lot of random stuff. What is the national lottery? The national They fund all lottery. kinds of stuff. I've received wages from places funded by the lottery so i've been funded by the lottery just going to do the the most podcaster thing we've done on this podcast which is to do the wikipedia definition of the national lottery which is the national lottery is the state franchised national lottery established in 1994 in the united kingdom it is operated by camelot group of all money spent on national lottery games around 53 percent goes to the prize fund and 25 percent to good causes oh so it it makes so much money that they can pay for the prize fund and just other stuff. 12% goes to the UK government as lottery duty, 4% what? to retailers as commission, and 5% to Camelot, which is the company that runs it, with 4% to cover operating costs and 1% as profit. Wow. The lottery is therefore immensely profitable. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's intense. So that prize pool, what did they say it was? Around 40 to 50% is the prize pool? 53% goes to the prize fund. Wow. So that prize that prize pool, if you ran it completely at a loss, it could be like twice as much. But the odds, it also gives the odds to win it, which are 45,057,474 to 1. Oh, yeah. When I was in university, a lecturer did, there's a kind of mathematics, actuarial mathematics, mm. which is how they process insurance claims. Mm. So it's all about working out probability-based investments. Mm. So is it worth spending this much based on the outcomes that mm. are possible? Mm. And you can do it off a pound coin and then work through what the odds are of winning. And it is not worth spending even a pound on the lottery, given yeah. the odds. Yeah. But of course it can't be, right? Because otherwise, how would it run exactly. at a profit? The, the world is full of little gambling things there's, there's legitimate gambling that people get addicted to all the time yeah. which we're not really as a society <laughs> beginning to do anything to combat well it's the dopamine thing isn't it it's the dopamine of like um the chance of getting the reward that's that's dope. it's not the guaranteed reward it's like the chance of it and that's what people get addicted to that's what mm. makes stuff addictive the, that's that's what makes the tiktok algorithm addictive because 
some of the stuff it'll show you won't like and some of it you'll be like oh this is great and then you'll keep yeah. searching through hundreds of shit loot boxes inside video games gambling for children <laughs> yeah uh but it's the ch- it's the chance the psychology of it is it's the chance of the win rather than a guaranteed good thing so you would get a th- you know some the human brain is is wired in some ways to get more joy from something that might be nice than something that's definitely nice <laughs> Yeah, wasn't that like one of the findings of like the Skinner box and uh, Skinner's pigeons yes, as well? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can't remember his full name, but a scientist called <laughs> called him Dr. Skinner uh-huh. just worked on different kind of feed dispensation from boxes yeah. in in cages with pigeons, was it? Parrots. And parrots maybe. And he he would change the conditions under which pressing the button would release food. Yeah. And one of them was um he'd just make them do it randomly uh, parrots would end up it's definitely not parrots I've, I've made a joke about it being parrots it's not parrots it's those hawks from um lord of the rings that, that get gandalf off the tower of isengard yeah it was that eagle they should have used to get to mordor straight away you'd think they'd be smartest because they're so big but they're actually really fucking thick <laughs> thick Isn't that seems to be the way i think big animals get stupider elephants are really smart apparently yeah apparently. And whenever you depict a giant <laughs> as if you don't believe it well, I get to see it, you know. <laughs> you can tell me, and then I look yeah, at it yeah, yeah. and I go, "Well, it's like someone told me once that a, a sparrow can understand grammar." And fuck, I'm like, what fuck does that off. mean? What's that mean? How What's do you mean? know that? Get fuck off with that! A sparrow can understand grammar. And Who told an you elephant's that? Very smart. Elephants, yeah. And a sparrow. Yes, but I, I haven't made a wild claim like a fucking sparrow who specifically <laughs> didn't understand grammar. I'm just saying there are claims you can make about the internal life of an animal that me, looking at an animal that can't communicate, I can't verify or know yeah. anything. Yeah, you can show fair. me an ant and go, that's... this is the smartest thing on the planet, but it's still an ant and yeah, it's just going to crawl they... around. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm with, I get what you mean. So there's, there's, there's got these fucking huge birds, this scientist. He discovers that people never really... The birds never really disengage from that relationship they create between the button and yeah. being fed by the machine. Yeah. And they'll end up like doing all what kinds they, what of... What do they get fed? Fudge. <laughs> <laughs> Don't feed birds fudge, listeners. <laughs> Big turnover Don't, of birds. Yeah, Shouldn't yeah, have fudge. Yeah, yeah. Big no-no. <laughs> So the the birds end up developing these things which look a lot like superstitions. Mm. So one bird might have noticed that if it pushes the button mm. and it, one of its legs is cocked, yeah. oh, food came out. Ah. So it will always cock its leg that time. Wow. And Or one bird might like spin around a 360 between pressing it because one time it did that and the food came out. Yeah. And one it developed these weird superstitions. Flip. Yeah, one bird might learn grammar in between pressing the button. <laughs> you know, you can be quite sceptical about psychological experiments done on animals and mm. then say, what does that teach us about human beings? But in this instance, much with every other instance, yeah. I believe it does. Because I think people who gamble quite a lot or are really into gambling yeah. genuinely believe they're good at it and that they're like applying some kind Your of system. interesting set of skill or tactics. Okay. They've got yeah, a system, yeah. but what they're really doing is they've created a set of superstitions, which are a lot like a hungry bird. But we've got a friend who who is banned from gambling shops because they are good at gambling. That's true. But that's a very specific subset of gambling. That's a specific set of sub-gambling where you actually have a lot of information, which I would say you don't necessarily have on a one-armed bandit. <laughs> <laughs> I've crunched it. I've worked out the diameter of the particular cylinder that holds the two cherries. If I hold the crank at just this angle and apply just the right <laughs> amount of force, I think I can rejig the flux capacitor to ensure I get all three bars. I, and I imagine this um, this dialogue is being delivered while panning slowly across a uh, a sort of budget saving anime frame where it's a character <laughs> explaining their internal dialogue stood in front of the gambling machine. <laughs> I think it's them explaining it. It zooms in on their face and then it pans to my face who's next to them and I'm just confused and I'm looking into the middle distance and there's just equations flying around my head (laughs) just to show I'm impressed but also I feel sick. And it goes like, the music goes like, and you're like, what's he doing? (laughs) Yeah. Oh my God, put it in straight English, will you? (laughs) Okay, Brainiac, we're going to pull the lever. Fuck, I lost. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, 
<laughs> what next, wise guy? <laughs> Mandatory Redistribution Party was created and produced by Sean Morley and Jack Lewis Evans. Our title theme was created by Ella Jean. I put Take Me Out to the Ball Game under the Will Chamberlain part because I hoped it might wind someone up that knows that that's supposed to be for baseball, not basketball. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that, whoever you are. If you enjoy this podcast, please do consider supporting us if you can at patreon.com forward slash mandatory redistribution party or by sharing this episode on social media thank you for all your support and for listening to the show we are glad people enjoy it it is cool you are cool keep honking